Welcome to Sunday morning at First Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor Danny Deeth, and it is hot in the summertime in Columbus, Georgia. Don't have to tell you that. I know y'all are out traveling, but no matter who you are, where you are, what you've done, whatever you have going on, God is welcoming you home. So we invite you to come and join us as we celebrate our awesome God of love and of grace and joy. Come on in. The first scripture today is from Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand, and we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is John 16, 12 through 15. This today is what we call Trinity Sunday, thinking about that mystical presence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, how they work together. Here's one piece from John that clues us in. John 16, 12 through 15. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. For this reason, I say that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So the old joke about the Trinity goes like this. Jesus, when speaking to the disciples, says, who do people say that I am? Remember that, uh, Matthew 16? And his disciples answered and said, some say you are John the Baptist, returned from the dead. Others say Elijah, some, some of the older prophets. And Jesus says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, Thou art the Logos, existing in the Father as his rationality, and then by an act of his will being generated in consideration in the various functions by which God is related to his creation, but only on the fact that Scripture seeks of a Father and a Son and a Holy Spirit, each member of the Trinity being co-equal with every other member and each acting inseparably with interpenetrating each other member with only an economic subordination within God, but causing no division which would make the substance no longer simple." And Jesus answered and said, what? (laughs) Yes, the doctrine of the Trinity. In some ways it is simple. It's all God in three different aspects. God, our creator. God, our redeemer in Christ, who was the form of God that came and took human form. And then the Holy Spirit, the sustainer that we celebrated according to Luke's account uh, in the book of Acts 2, uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, that spirit that stays with us and is that presence of God with us that sustains us through this life and into the next. It's harder when we start thinking about how those pieces interact with each other. If Jesus is God's son, how is God's son still a part of God? And then the spirit is, is it God's spirit or Jesus' spirit? And are they the same? Are they different? And the church has been fighting about this 
for a very long time. One of the contributing factors to the great schism of 1054 that separated um, European Christianity into the Western church and into the Eastern churches that became Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, and others was exactly this understanding of where the Holy Spirit came from. Did it come from Jesus or did it come from God? Is God the big entity and then other two, is it God, Jesus, then the Holy Spirit in that order of importance? And the big division between East and West at that time was whether the Holy Spirit came from Jesus or it came from God, knowing that Jesus is God, but yet different than God. And so uh, there were other political factors that led to that, that split as well. Uh, another one being uh, unleavened bread, whether we can and cannot use that in communion. Um, and then there were other political factors. But this, this filioque uh, from which the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Son was a big source of contention. And we're still trying to wrestle with this. So we spent two weeks before Pentecost talking about the role of the Holy Spirit when, the Holy, when Jesus ascends, goes back to heaven, the Spirit descends and is the presence of God with us. And we've talked about the role of that Holy Spirit being a comforter, one that comforts us, one that teaches us, one that reminds us about Christ, an advocate, as Christ says, I'm getting ready to go, friends, telling his disciples, but I'm going to send you another advocate who will be with you and help you remember everything that I have taught. The Holy Spirit convicts us when we start to go astray. That Spirit leads us back to God when we listen, when we allow that Spirit to fill us and become at the core. It is all good, friends, this Holy Spirit that leads us. Today, the focus is a little bit different as we look at this understanding of the Trinity. It's a short passage. I still have many things to say to you. Jesus is telling, this is the farewell discourse in John. He's getting ready to go, to be betrayed, crucified, um, resurrected, and then ascend, go back to God. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. It's interesting, isn't it? You cannot bear them now. One of the reasons the disciples never seem to fully get it until the Spirit descends at Pentecost is because they can't fathom what Jesus is saying to them. Think about this in terms of parent-child relationship. Parents, have you ever talked to your children and they're not in a place to listen to what you're saying? Every day? Teenagers rolling the eyes and, oh, dad. Or they may get a piece of what you're saying, but because we as parents explain so well and sometimes so long, they tune off somewhere in the middle and may miss some of your excellent teaching conversation. Or there are times when we don't want to deal sometimes with what we have to hear. You're in a doctor's office and you get bad news, a diagnosis. That is overwhelming and we shut down at that point from whatever else the doctor says after that because we're trying to deal with something big and we can't really hear or process the rest. At work, maybe it's hard if you're the boss and that employee's set of gifts really don't match the job description and you have to tell them it's time we have to move you on. Or if you're that employee, the same thing. This understanding of not being necessarily in the right place and right time or right frame of mind to understand what people tells us is at the heart of what Jesus is saying the Spirit does. He's saying, I'm getting ready to go and I have told you so much. But as he says, I've said many things, but you cannot bear them now. I'm going to send you the spirit and it's going to stay with you and it's going to continue to remind you of what I have said, remind you 
of what I have done, remind you and teach you about everything, about me, about my word, and then how to go forward. It's that kind of time delay. It's that Holy Spirit, we know far more than the disciples did in that day from our Bible, and yet we are still learning all the time, or we should be. The Spirit works within each of us to continue to offer fresh connections to God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, our world, our faith, what we're here to do in the world. The Spirit is fresh. The Spirit renews us. We've talked about those aspects as well. And Jesus is saying, this Spirit is going to stay with you and help you continue to understand who I am. When the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all truth. Okay, now we get into trouble. If you remember in John's Gospel, when Jesus is standing before Pilate, Pontius Pilate, getting ready to be condemned and sentenced to death. Pilate asked Jesus, are you the king of the Jews? Because they're saying that you are. And Jesus says, well, I have, I have come to be the king, but my kingdom is not of this, this earth. The truth of my kingdom. And Pilate says what? Looks at Jesus square in the eyes and says, what is truth? Today, this focus in John is on the spirit of truth, that part of the Trinity that continues to tell us what truth is. We are in a culturally ambiguous time about what that word means. Truth as we understand it has become subjective. There are so few ultimate truths that we as people and a culture can rely on that we're having a hard time talking and listening to each other. There are certain universal truths that we know as human beings. We must drink water and eat food to survive. We need to rest. We want very similar things across the nation and the world as far as family and a way to earn a living, a fulfill, leading a fulfilling life. But there are also other areas in which the truth is taking a beating. Why? Because no one can say ultimately what is true for someone else anymore, or can they? Certainly our political truths are very different. Our political realities are very different. The whole phrase fake news is now used by everyone if it's not their truth, their perspective. We are in a time that if we only listen to our people and our side, that is our truth despite what anyone else might have to say. Would you all agree with that premise? I'm going to do a little experiment, okay? So I need you, congregation, including the choir, to close your eyes. I'm not going to harm you, trust me. Just close your eyes for just a second. You'll be okay, I promise. Okay. You can open your eyes. A little Norma Ray right here, Sally Field. Um, congregation, what color is the poster board that you are seeing? Choir, what color is the poster you are seeing? What? What? Congregation, what color is the poster you are seeing? Choir? Oh, no. Oh, no. How certain are you, congregation, that this is a red piece of poster board? Are you 80%? Are you 90%? Are you 100% sure this is a red poster board? Well, you're not anymore because I'm screaming at you. <laughs> but yes, of course it is. Choir, are you similarly convinced that you see a blue poster board? 
No, I mean, sadly. <laughs> yes, and that's exactly right. All I have to do is turn it around, and it is the other side. <laughs> Ten years ago ish, with our Chick fil A chicken nugget meal when the girls were little, came a little CD, and on the CD, that is a compact disc. It had stories on it, and one story was an African fable called Red Hat, Green Hat. Very similar to what I just did, two lifelong friends who owned fields in Africa were meeting each other for the day. There was a road that went in between their fields. Hello, lifelong friend, you are wonderful. Yes, it's a fantastic, a beautiful day. I'm so lucky to have you as a friend, back and forth. Then someone walks down the road between them, and the hat is red on one side, and green on the other side. And the one on the red side says, that was a beautiful red hat that she wore, wasn't it? And the one said, it was a beautiful hat, but it wasn't red, it was green. And he says, oh friend, you must not have seen the same hat that I saw. Oh friend, I did see, I know my colors, I know what I saw, don't tell me what I saw and didn't see. And on and on and on, till they were friends no more. And this idea of truth has become so skewed because of the information that we get, our understanding that often ours is only the sense of truth that is real. The phrase, speak your truth, something that I've heard in recent common vernacular, speak your truth. Why is it your truth? Well, it's your experiences. It's your understanding, it's your context in life that leads you to believe a certain set of truths for you. But life is very different for this person A than this person B. Depending on our context, our understanding, and the way that we live our lives. So when we say truth, it is very difficult to nail that down. It may be true for us to a certain degree, but when we start talking about others, truth is subjective and in the eye of that beholder. Well, so then what does Jesus say here? And let, let me finish that. It, it was no mistake that the poster board was red on one side and blue on the other. That is our Democrat and Republican general colors. What happens when we only see one side? We think we have the truth. If we only see our one color and other people are looking a little bit differently, if we don't take the extra time to look around and do our work and see what other people are seeing, then we are, cannot claim truth. Now you can look at the other side, see what someone else is thinking and say, well, I, I don't agree with that, but I understand what they're saying. That's all I'm trying to advocate for here. But when we only listen to our side and stay siloed in the same programs, commentators, sources that say the same thing over and over, we only get one side of that poster board. We only get one color instead of two. So I just encourage all of us, even though I know it takes more time, what does the other side say about the same issue that I'm so sure about and all of my people are saying that they are sure about? And what are the facts? What are the truths that this side says? And then what does this side say? Because often they are different truths and different facts. How can facts be different? Welcome to our quandary. So yes, stand on what you believe but take that extra step to look at the other side, literally, to see the color from that other side and what they would say. It may not always be enlightening, but at least we understand one another a little better. So the spirit of truth, how can we claim truth in this sense? Well, to John, our gospel writer, the spirit of truth is 100% rooted in Christ. John is not saying, are you a Pharisee or a Sadducee? How do you understand the implementation of the purity laws from 
Moses's day that we implement now, temple life, all of that. John isn't saying, what party do you belong to? He's saying there is only one sense of ultimate truth and that is in Christ. And this is the spirit that connects you to that. The spirit of truth comes. He will not guide you. He will guide you into all truth. He won't speak on his own. He's going to speak whatever he hears from me. Again, we're all meshed up here in God, Father, and the Holy Spirit working together. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you, says Jesus about the Holy Spirit. All that the Father has is mine for this reason. He will take what is mine and declare it to you. So again, we see God working in these three pieces. God gives things to Jesus and then the Spirit helps us understand what those things are. The spirit of truth is that which functions every day to remind us of what ultimate truth is. And the only true truth that John can say we proclaim is that which is rooted in Christ. So then what are we supposed to do about that truth? Once we understand it, we then go. When you have found the truth, we're called to stand in that truth. The disciples could have then understood. The disciples could have, after Pentecost, when they received the Holy Spirit, finally understood everything about Jesus. They could have said, that is great, and gone back to fishing or tax collecting or whatever else they did prior to being called. But it wasn't just the understanding, it was then standing on that spirit of truth, knowing that that spirit would continue to be with them for the rest of their journey. It gave them the courage to go out into a divided world and to use their gifts to people who just didn't understand, who wanted to harm them, who thought they were crazy, who wanted them dead or imprisoned. What enabled them to go out into that environment? We think it's bad now, it was worse then. It is the spirit of truth of what Christ told them that continued to be filled through this gift of the spirit. So as we go forth today on this Trinity Sunday, we give thanks to God for this holy mystery and that's what it is. It is a holy mystery, but we know that all of it is God. All of it works together for us in community. We weren't called to live as individuals. We've talked about that the last few weeks. We are called and filled by the spirit through our faith communities and the larger body of Christ. So seek that ultimate truth, that ultimate truth in Christ. And then when you can get to that point, allow that spirit of truth to fill you and lead you so that the world would know about the resurrection of this Christ. Hallelujah. Amen.